nice vacations? Yeah. yeah. David, did you have nice vacations? Very much. Good. Very much. But this is fantastic outside, isn't this? Sure is. Yeah, it's um, I woke up this morning as well. The wheel. Yeah. Well, well, it's so fantastic to get out this morning. But. Yeah. No, <laughs> were you stuck out there, was it? No, no, it was like a guy plowing the... Oh. Uh, it's real drive. nature beauty, you know? Now, I hope when it's freezing again, and then it's knowing that it doesn't get too heavy, and then the trees break down. You had a lot of power outages today. I had one, yeah. Already, yeah. But I have a generator in the back, which starts right away when the electricity goes, the generator comes. <laughs> and I think I will have a second one on the other side. You know, it, uh, for a long time it goes well, and then suddenly overnight it happens. Did you have that put in about five years ago? Yeah. Well, that was your, birth your birthday party weekend. Yeah, well, I had that birthday, which you know, suddenly uh, electricity broke down and we couldn't celebrate. I think it was my 80th birthday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was sad. Okay, let's start. Uh, Dustin, can we turn this light on there, maybe? And uh, then Just I, maybe I stay here, and then we are all comfortable. Um, I want to give you your papers back. First, yeah, this one there. Oh, no, you have to do it over there. Where do I? Oh, it's on over this there, side. Yeah, here. on the other side. Yeah, that's it. Okay, very good. good. There it is. Okay, here we have the philosophy of Hegel's philosophy of history. We can put that over there. Ready? Okay. Here you have your grades. And uh, I want to give you your papers back. Here is the new test which we want to discuss today. So everybody gets a copy. Socialism, very good. 
we pop that up once more in our in our next thing there, dangerous method, we discuss that too. Um, as for a distinction between a Semitic and an Aryan psychoanalysis, I think that this movie does not necessarily provide support. So do we that's an interesting question, you know, do we uh, in the movie which we saw, uh, did we see that uh, Jung proposed an Aryan type of a, of a, you know psychology, and what would that be like, and Freud the Semitic one? So we did see there was uh, developing an antagonism between the two, <laughs> but the antagonism was about authority. Uh, somehow uh, Freud thought that if he would give uh, Jung the associations to his dream that this would violate his authority, and Jung took that very badly. But then in the discussion with the girl, the girl, the psychotic, um, you know, um, mentally ill girl, um, she was Jewish, and there was a struggle where she should go. And there is a discussion between her, and he says to her, in the end, we will always know that we are Jewish. And so he somehow takes her on as a as a patient away from Jung, as if Jung was not the right uh, type. But the at the time when this discussion took place, that's when Jung then became a fascist. So um, the uh, later on, he converted and went away from fascism, but I don't think he really changed his psychoanalysis. So it's psychology of individuation, it is called. And so what is really Aryan there in, in it, or fascist? So, I mean, he gave an interpretation uh, before the war, during the war, uh, that the Germans had thrown their shadow on the Jews and that's why they killed them. But that was after the conversion. But before the conversion, he said that Hitler was a symbol of the archetype of self. That's a very high thing. That is what Buddha is. That's what Mohammed can be, and that's so on. So, um, so, and therefore, they, they followed him because Hitler was a symbol of the self, not of the anima, not of the animus, we know the model which we had of the psyche. There's the ego, there's the id, there's the superego, and there is the outside world where people are acting in. So, the, um, but Jung um, used his psychoanalysis in order to support the fascist movement for many years. And uh, because he thought that Hitler was the symbol of the archetype of self. When he then converted, then he said that the Germans took the shadow of the self. So the anima, the animus, and the self have a positive side and a negative side, a shadow. And so the shadow of the self was thrown on the Jews and on the communists, we took that almost together here. By the way, there is a controversy about this. Um, there are many Jewish people who deal with the six million Jews dead as if they had nothing to do with the Second World War or with the 27 million communists which were killed. They have to be seen together. They were killed together. While the 27 million communists were killed, also the six million Jews were killed in the same area, almost in Eastern, Eastern Europe. So... So, but it is still not enough to say why why this uh, you know is why that is Aryan and why it is why the other one is Semitic, except that we have a Semite, a Jew who created the one, and then the other one uh, was an Aryan, and he used it in support of fascism. But what has changed in the model? That would be important. So, for Freud, the id has these two instincts. One is the libidinous one, 
which is very broad. It can be anal, then it can be oral, it can be genital. These are different stages, how it develops. And he had that other instinct that was the equation, the killer instinct. So and then there were, of course, selfish things, selfish drives um, they, in addition to it. So, um, so, but what did now Jung add to it? which would make the originally Semitic psychoanalysis into an Aryan one. Well, what he added were these archetypes. He said there is much more in the it than sexual tribes or aggressive tribes. It has a content in a certain sense. And so these archetypes are fundamental dynamic elements in the psyche, um, which give us energy and um, what has to happen is that the male archetype and the female archetype have to get married in the self, a holy marriage. If this marriage takes place, then one is an individual. So the goal of the individuation process is that one becomes this great, powerful individual. And uh, he saw in the fairy tales and religion and all this, he saw a way how this was worked out. So when in the Middle Ages the women were sitting together and were weaving, then they were telling stories like Hansel and Gretel or um, the Little Dwarfs or whatever. <laughs> and in these stories, uh, the drama happened that, the, for instance, the, the shadow of the animus would be a little dwarf. The positive side of the animus would be the prince who kisses the girl so that she wakes up out of her dream, and so on. So, on the other hand, the anima, the witch, would be the negative side of the anima, and the queen, the good queen, would be the positive side. So, as the girls weaving listen to those stories, through those stories, this holy marriage took place in them, so that when they would get married then, that would have happened in them. So that means in every woman there is the anima, which is dominant, and then there is also the animus, the male part, in her body as well as in her psyche. But that is recessive. So the dominant female anima and the recessive animus are married in her so that when she gets married she will not be bitchy anymore or immature or nagging or whatever. The same thing happens to the boys. So in them the animus is dominant and the anima is recessive in their bodies, chest, everything. And the, also these two have to be married in the self so that then the fellow is mature when the time of marriage comes. And then you have two mature individuals and then the marriage will work out well. And they will not have this struggle of the sexes all the time, back and forth and, and, and so on. And uh, finally maybe it will even blow up. So, so that was the... Um, so if there is anything Aryan, uh, then it must be that difference between uh, between Freud and uh, and Jung, and the difference is this theory of anima, animus, and and so on. So um, of course we have already the dreams with Freud, and we have the dreams. So that cannot be the the difference really. Uh, so the in, in the beginning, um, uh, Jung was a Kantian, and Kant, as we saw, is an enlightener. So, um, therefore, he was in the Enlightenment camp. But when he introduced those anima and animus, the archetypes, and the symbols of the archetypes in the religious texts, and uh, in the in fairy tales and in dreams and so on, he went over to the romantic side. So, <laughs> the Freudian progressive thing is, Enlightenment means where it is, ego must be. But then... Jung, in his development, turned it around and said, where ego is, it must be. That is the romantic position. 
against the Enlightenment position. And of course, fascism is a romantic movement. Earth and blood and all this stuff, and uh, it's appearing in a knight uniform and, and so on and so on. So fascism has part of Enlightenment, but it is also an anti-Enlightenment thing at the same time. Um, we said, with, when we saw the Hitler movie and so on, that Hitler was certainly a genius in terms of timing. They called him the great phenomenologist who also could find the right kairos, the right moment and so on. But the overall, the forest was wrong. That means the two forces which moved into the foreground, the Slavic world, we have it now in Kiev again, uh, and the American world which moves into the foreground, he declared war to both of them and wanted practically to do something what England had done 100 or 200 years before or what the Germans had done during the Middle Ages when there was a German Empire. So it could not be done anymore. It was too late. And this lateness did him in. Not only the movie which Dustin saw on Stalingrad, and please look at this, that fits very well into our context here, <laughs> so that, that the Sixth Army got lost and so on, that, that the details, and then the battle in Kursk, which took place a few months later, um, got lost and so on. So this is how it got lost, but the deeper reason um, why the thing was lost, it was lost from the very beginning as a project. England could still uh, have India as a colony, we could have Central America and South America as a colony and so on. But to do that in the 20th century now, and that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to make Kiev and, uh, and uh, Petersburg and Moscow, that whole territory was supposed to be a common colony, like England had a colony and like we have this colony today. As a matter of fact, we say we are anti-colonial, but in reality, we only put governments in there which protect our economic interests and kept the, the economic power in all these states, if it's oil or whatever. So um, it is, it's a phony type of a thing. The, this one cannot even say that people were let free politically and are on, only caught economically because we put all these dictators in into, into Egypt and into uh, uh, Lebanon and other places so in order to control the brotherhood and, and so on so it is not even politically free so it has to see when we say post-colonial is it really post or does it not in a certain sense go on so there but back yes isn't there also the issue with social unconscious in the sense that Jung has that theory that social right. unconscious and no matter if you're not of the history yeah. of that group of the Aryans in this case that right. no matter how long you've been assimilated into yeah, you're that's not a good, that's a good idea. Yeah, so I mean, it's not only individual unconscious, right? He also knows of a collective unconscious. But um, uh, Freud had the collective unconscious too. Uh, and so it is something. What is the difference in it? And the difference, I think, is this theory of archetypes, which is fundamentally uh, romantic, and the archetypes are not historical. That is something very important. That means they have not come about in the human uh, development, evolution, slowly this dip these dispositions accumulated or so, but they are ontologized, so they belong to our being, so to speak. And therefore they can also not historically be changed, so that we can really free ourselves from these archetypes, from these archaic forces. There's no way to free ourselves from them. We have to become in touch with them and so on, but they themselves are not, have, don't have a historical origin, nor can they therefore be changed historically. So these would be some ways to say why there is, why we could. Freud only says, you know, Freud really says that he, that his psychoanalysis is really Jewish. And he wanted to uh, use Jung in order to get out of the Jewish ghetto. But then something else became of what he wanted. And therefore he uh, opposed Jung and uh, you know, fought him and, and the fighting was back and forth and so on. And in our movie, um, that girl is in the middle of that struggle. 
<laughs> where because she is Jewish and uh, but then it's not so simple and clear cut because Jung falls in love with the Jewish person and we um, we have that all over Germany where you have quite a lot of Nazis even people in the concentration camps who fell in love with Jewish women and so on against the whole theory or so so um, there is some kind of a connection I have once written something about the German Jewish tragedy um, they hate each other and in a certain strange way they also love each other so it's not only that the two types uh, Semitic and Aryan it goes back I mean you have the Aryans already in the uh, in the Hebrew Bible so it's a long struggle between those two races and uh, why the Jewish people and not the Arabic people, which are also, are also Semitic, um, why they are so much in the foreground all the time, that is, a, is another riddle. So, nevertheless, um, here the Semitic and the Arab psychoanalysis, I think that this movie does not necessarily provide support here. I mean, the movie shows, you know, that there is that something Semitic about the psychoanalysis, but what is this, you know? The Freud came from Eastern Europe, and in Eastern Europe there was uh, the Hame, uh, mysticism, Kabbalism, and so on. And when he uh, interprets the the dreams, for instance, he almost behaves like a mystical rabbi who uh, looks at every word and every image and interprets it and so on. So it seems almost uh, to that the rabbinical art of exegesis and so on has been continued into the psychoanalysis. So, uh, um, but we want to be relaxed about the whole thing and see, you know, if one can really use that. Um, I mean, the whole race theory because of the terrible things which happened, you know, is, has become in disrepute. But I think there is an anthropology of race. And what the fascists have done, and they have not invented it, was invented in England and in France in the century before Hitler. So <laughs> I think there are different races. There are Africans and Asians and Easterners and Europeans and Americans and so on. What was wrong with them is when they hierarchized it and said that some of them are superior and so that the Aryans are superior over all the others. That is when it all became distorted then. <laughs> and they went into detail, so uh, they thought, you know, that an African uh, could not really, uh, <coughs> um, he could he could drive a motorcycle, <coughs> we would teach him and so on, but he couldn't, uh, couldn't repair it and he couldn't build it and he couldn't invent it and so on. <coughs> there was, of course, this irregularity about the Japanese, they were Asian, so how can Asians suddenly have those dive bombers and all this? And so they invented something new. They said that the island had been settled by Aryans before the present Japanese. And so therefore they had this Aryan blood in them. And that made it possible why they could have these big ships and could function so well and so on. So, um, and even with these, uh, you know, half Aryans and, and all that, that was all constructed in those terms. We can look a little bit more at that, but that is very good here. So uh, we just had this issue there about Aryan and and um, the liberals, you know, because race played such an awful role. Then said we don't want to talk about race at all anymore. But that that means to throw out the baby with the bath water. I think um, there is such a thing, and it's not only physically but it's also mentally, I think there are different racial personalities um, at work too at the same time, but we don't want to go into this here, in spite of the fact that of course anti-Semitism plays a great role in the critical theory. Okay, very good, here it is. Good work, good work. Um, so I can give that back to you. Okay. And so everybody has it now, back, and uh, let me see, um, here there are unbelievable amount of contemporary issues, <laughs> but we don't want to go into them.
you all um, want to look um, at our test today and discuss that and uh, you have a week for that and if you want to you can also have two weeks so we can discuss it um, next time too um, a few things which I wanted to say here before we go into that and um, look at the test the test the purpose is not to test you really the, but to sum it up you know what we want to do and put it into writing and then you can put it together with your notes there <laughs> so that's what we want to do from the 12th the day to the 17th but you can have a week longer <laughs> and you can decide again if you want to do it uh, you know if you want to concentrate on a book by Fromm and by Habermas or by Harnett or if you just want to answer those questions there. Uh, we will make an excursion to the mosque and uh, we want to introduce, when we talk about religion here, we want to introduce, uh, include all the Abrahamic religions and Buddhism if possible and so on too, but this is not mainly here about religion. Um, there is, uh, I think I told you already, there is this online course, Psychology of Religion, if you are interested, that's in summer one. And then there is religion and social ethics and, and uh, religion revolution in uh, in fall there. And um, contemporary issue, uh, we can take one if you want to before we start discussing. Um, then the new background reading is uh, Siebert from uh, How Camus Critical Theory of Religion, the um, Relative and the Transcendent. And then you can choose again a book by Fromm or a book by Habermas or by Harnett, or you can also take another one if you want to. Substantial issues will come up and we discuss the test. And then we want to have a few more movies there on fascism. We had Hitler there, but we want to look maybe at the Nuremberg thing. <laughs> and then we also want to see where fascism continues. So one country where it continues is El Salvador, so therefore we can see how similar the methods are, the terrorism is, and, and so on. Uh, so that, unfortunately, fascism, the Arena Party in, uh, in El Salvador is a fascist party, and um, we had uh, in other Latin American countries as well. Many of the fascists who could run away, they all went to Argentine or Brazil or whatever, where they found their friends there, so it's full of full of them. Um, so unfortunately, with Hitler's death uh, and his type of fascism, National Socialism, he thought had come to its end because of the Jews and so on. But um, there are the other types of fascism, and particularly Mussolini's corporatism, uh, you know, continues uh, in many ways. So in the methods, and but also the mentality. I had uh, my son is one of very much on the right. Thomas was here over the weekend, and then I met the devil in the swimming pool too. And um, whatever you touch there, if it's unemployment compensation or if it's the, um, the uh, what is it, the minimum wage, or if it is the uh, unemployment compensation and so on, it is just a madhouse uh, what what comes out there. Uh, just a simple thing which I had with both of them, which seems to be so simple, uh, namely that a businessman has nothing else to do than to fulfill the needs of people. So uh, we have this idea here of civil society, which means need system, administration of justice, and then employer and employee associations like labor unions and so on, and then particularly the police force, policing, local police, state police, federal police, but policing in a much wider sense, like to police the economy in order to prevent, uh, uh, prevent depressions or inflation <coughs> and so on, so policing. So, But the simple thing which I discussed with both of them, that the, the basis of civil society is the need system and that all of the businessmen have to do is to fulfill those needs. That means to produce food, to produce clothing, and not bad food, but good food, which makes people healthy, and uh, then uh, homes, housing, and uh, then health care and education. So these are the fundamental needs. And both of them protested. Uh, my, my son said if he 
uh, had thought that the businessman task was to fulfill needs, he would never have gone into business. So, but he is in travel. So, I mean, if people didn't have the need to travel, there wouldn't be travel agencies. Nobody would be employed, and nobody could make profit from travel as these travel agencies do. So, what is so? What is the mystery behind all of this? As if maybe the profit making or whatever is completely uncoupled from fulfilling the needs. But even the worst businessman will pay at least lip service that he fulfills some needs. And it can also be that they really turn it upside down, namely, <coughs> there are no needs, but they create them artificially, particularly for luxuries. Capitalism can much easier produce luxury things than, people, than things which are necessary for daily living and so on. So, so this uh, uh, was, was so astonishing in both cases, that this uncoupling of business and the need system. And then the second thesis, which I brought to both of them, was that if the businessman wants to keep the state out of the uh, out of civil society and uh, wants to deregulate and so on, all what they have to do is just to fulfill their duties. If after 200 years they do not come up with a, a health insurance for all people or come up with millions of people having no health insurance, millions of people have a miserable health insurance which cannot even keep up to any uh, normal standards. Health insurance without hospital care, health insurance without eye care, without dentistry and whatsoever, which millions of Americans have, which they lose now. Because according to state law, these are deficient type of contracts and they cannot stand anymore. They have to be replaced. So, but if they, after 200 years, still have all that poverty and all these slums and so on, then they, it doesn't work. Their mode of production does not work. Wherever somebody, whether it's a food kitchen or whatever, that means capitalism doesn't work. The market does not reach these people. And wherever there are homeless people, capitalism does not work. And wherever there are slums, capitalism doesn't work. So then the government has to intervene. What the hell do they think? They think they can malfunction like this, and then people go on suffering or whatever. So these are two things where I think we really have an insane type of situation. That's not, it's not healthy. To go into business and not to know that business is there to fulfill these needs, and then to shout and scream against the government in spite of the fact that they cannot create enough jobs. The Romney said it is not the task of the state to to create jobs. Then he criticized Obama for not having created jobs. Then he promised himself as the state, as the government, he would create jobs. And so, so it's just confused in their heads. There is something deeply wrong there. So the the it is very simple that the only thing what they have to do in order to keep the government out of business is to function well and to fulfill these needs and to employ people so that they produce commodities which fulfill these needs it doesn't need a uh, mind for quantum physics to uh, to to see these simple things there but it cannot be seen so and what they then somehow uh, uh, assert is that in spite of the fact that they don't function, the state should still stay out of the whole business, and that therefore people should still, in the millions, to suffer because the bastards want to make profit. I mean, this is where really the insanity reaches the peak. And it's not only an individual, say, of these two people or whatever, it's obviously in the culture so that people suck it in. I mean, my son, I know, I educated him, so uh, he didn't get it from me, not from his mother or whatever. So it came from the culture, from outside, from business people who told him all this. So, <laughs> so then, uh, you know, as far as contemporary issues, are concerned, you wanted to say something? Oh, yeah, I was just yeah. going to mention every time you know, run into something like that, with the, you know, the, the state is not supposed to create jobs, but then, you yeah. know, why aren't they creating jobs? It always reminds me of uh, Orwell's concept of double think. You know, yeah. where we can hold two completely right. dissonant thoughts within our heads and, and be completely okay with it. Yeah. I was reading uh, an article a couple weeks back about these. Uh, there's a couple states that were trying to pass uh, freedom of religion laws, which basically, when you you read what these laws are actually about, it seems as though really it's more of a religious tyranny law. Freedom you know, to yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Freedom to make yeah. my religion.
religion the only religion right. and make everyone else not so free. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we do it all the time. Sure. Yeah. Right. So, um, I mean, whatever we can do, you know, in, in terms, I mean, in terms of the critical theory and the praxis of it, you know, is to engage in those things. I mean, with the devil in the swimming pool there, I, I couldn't even swim because I had to discuss with him all the time. And I just go there once a week in order to do swimming and he ruined my swim there. And so. But um, we have some kind of obligation, you know, to uh, to talk. But it, it's not a normal discourse, right? Because, and that's what people say against Habermas very often, it needs really healthy people to come together in a discourse, you know, to uh, to listen to the other and, uh, and not to be hooked by your own instincts or whatever, to give space, you know, and say, well, let me listen to you. And <laughs> that means, you know, that one has to be willing to listen to my son too and to listen to this fellow there too, what they say, and not simply say, well, they're a stupid right winger or whatever. So in detail, the uh, devil is in the detail very often. So if he says, he was in the swimming pool, he was a salesman for insurance, insurance salesman. And um, he said, what is this called? K, K what? Which people have the K something, this pension 401K. thing. 401k. 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 So 401k. 401k. Okay. So he said, well, I always tell him not to take 401k because there, you know, your money increases so slowly. So after you come to the end of your life, maybe you have $60,000 or whatever. But uh, I, I, I sell them annuities and so on. So in annuities, you know, they have in the same time, they will have $2 million or whatever, you know. And I said, well, what if a crash comes, like 1929 and 2008 or whatever? He said, no, it's, it isn't touched by it, isn't touched by it. But I lost $500,000 in my annuities, which we have in the pension fund in the Western here. So, uh, and, and everybody else did that. So, obviously, it is not safe. So, I mean, they must be correct in their statements then. That is one thing. And we ourselves have to be correct. But one has to listen to their arguments, you know, about the, why these people are down there because they are lazy and because they don't have the partisan ethics and so on and so on. Um, you hear that all the time. My other son is a lawyer in New York. Why are these people in the slums in, the, in, these, in these projects? Because they don't have the partisan ethics or whatever. And so there are all kinds of mechanisms which people have been built up in order to unload their, their conscience, you know. It's, it's nothing wrong with liberalism, nothing wrong with the market and so on. What's wrong? These damned guys who don't take these op- beautiful opportunities which they have. So uh, now, I mean, if there are lazy people, and there are lazy people, <laughs> but can one base, you know, the whole legislation on lazy people, or should one not <coughs> make uh, the good legislation, and then when it doesn't function here and there, then one has to take care of what uh, what is wrong with it. So, <laughs> with this Obamacare, you know, it's not simply to uh, throw it out and not having anything else, but to say, okay, we have it now, four million have it, or whatever, now let's see, you know, who abuses it, or whatever, and then you have to legislate in order to stop abuses. But the substance of the thing may be very well, okay, if you want to throw everything out because it is abused, you cannot have anything, including religion. It's used, abused all the time. So do you want to throw it out because it's abused? Sex is abused. Everything is abused, right? So, so therefore, one has to go to the positive thing and then see what went wrong with it and then legislate this. That would be a normal opposition you know, if we had one. <laughs> okay, so that was one thing, but um, maybe we are too simple, you know, uh, so my son would say, you know, what I said that would is romanticism, or um, what did he say? It's romantic, or it's idealistic, and, and so on and so on. And so, uh, so he has no uh, education beyond the high school and so on. But he has read a lot, and is smart guy, and uh, you know has educated himself. So he knows those words. But um, I mean. There is no great philosophical system which is not idealistic. Marx thinks, you know, he was historical materialism, but 
how can I call him uh, uh, proletarian idealism and so on? Because um, you could not even think without having uh, some kind of notions to operate with and so on. So, um, but um, when we say, you know, need system and administration of justice and policing or whatever, um, what is romantic about that, you know? Um, or we said fascism, you know, has some romantic tendencies. So it would mean that this notion, you know, of civil society is an old-fashioned one or belongs to another time and we are beyond that now. And so, so that would be or idealistic um, that you start not with the whole, talk about civil society, but you start with the particulars which you find in the marketplace and so on. And then you argue from the particular and that means you look at the trees but you don't look at the forest. When you look at the forest you're then an idealist and possibly also a romantic idealist being backward and so on. So <coughs> he could probably not spell that out but it is worthwhile you know to take that seriously um, because it would not be good you know it would not help if we in the present situation would simply go back to feudalism or whatever. So um, and uh, I mean, idealism, it can have hundreds of meanings, you know. Uh, when people say somebody is an idealist, somebody who doesn't look for money but does things without money, that is an idealist. So we have all kinds of vulgar concepts of idealism and so on. So one would have to, to look what, what what people mean when they use those words. So <laughs> Okay, so the other thing is very shortly, you know, contemporary issue, um, there it is still on Sunday. On Sunday, the Crimea will vote. Um, the Parliament has already decided to go to uh, uh, to join as an independent state the Russian Federation, and um, so. But they want to substantiate this by referendum. So on Sunday there will be a referendum, and 75, 80 percent of the Crimea are Russian. So it is almost, uh, uh, um, say, uh, I mean, certain that that they will join the Russian Federation and uh, so there is much turmoil about it, about the weakness of Obama and, and so on. So um, the uh, the cause of the whole thing is it was a miscalculation of the CIA and some Western Europeans and so on. They thought they could, um, um, there was a Russian friendly president in Kiev and he um, wanted to cancel an agreement with the European Union. That part, uh, for the fourth round, for ground, neoliberals and neo-fascists, and um, whatever the color of the revolution is, it is not a revolution, it's a counter-revolution. That means it continues 1989. It continues the revolution of 1989. And um, it was um, somehow they had these protests and uh, the government tried to repress these, these protests and I think about 70 people or so may have been killed and um, so then the Europeans wanted to res rescue that and the French ambassador and the German ambassador went to Kiev and they made a, a treaty there according to which uh, the present government which had refused the agreement with the European Union that he would stay in there and then they would have an election in May. But then overnight those people, these neoliberals and fascists uh, threatened his life and wanted to kill him because he had killed those 70. And so he left and for some time they didn't know where he went and they thought he went maybe into Crimea but he really went to Russia and uh, yesterday he left Russia again and he is in the western Ukraine, that is strange, and gave speeches in the western Ukraine. Yeah, yeah right, he came, came back again. So, um, and, uh, so, the, 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 so then they made a coup d'etat and threw that guy out and he went to Russia now he is back then gave speeches and maybe he leaves again or whatever. But um, the, what, what the, the coup d'etat people broke right away that treaty which the government had just made with the European Union. So it was illegal, the whole thing. 
And Obama uh, says, you know, the referendum on Sunday is non-constitutional, and at the same time, he does not worry when a coup d'etat takes place. And in, uh, in, in Egypt, there was a coup d'etat too, and he just said, we don't call it that way. There was a president from the Brotherhood, and he was legitimately in there, and the military junta took him out. And that was undemocratic and unconstitutional, so and we said, well, we, we just don't call it that way. And the, and the guy is still in prison or whatever, or whatever. He doesn't even know exactly where, where the president from the Brotherhood is at that time, I think. So um, uh, so this is where, where also Obama, you know, has his weaknesses and all this. We don't have to go into this. But <coughs> now, the obviously, the whole thing doesn't work. And the Ukraine, if it stays together at all, has to pay her price, it loses, you know, a certain part of its territory. That is the result of this now. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the Crimea was given as, as uh, an award or whatever to the Ukraine for giving up the atomic bomb. So now they have given up the atomic bomb and now they lose the award which they got, namely the Crimea. Uh, that is not a nice thing, but it may not even be the end of the whole story. Because now, after Sunday, the Ukraine is completely encircled. That means it sits in the middle and the whole U the uh, Russian Federation is all around it now. And the eastern part of them is a shaky one because they're also to a large extent all Russians who then may suddenly get the idea, you know, that they also want to join the European Union, in, uh, uh, the, the uh, Russian Federation. And then there remains only a small thing from Kiev to the west who didn't belong to the Russian area anyway before. So um, that they become independent and then they little state, uh, you know, will join the European Union or whatever, and it would mean that the Ukraine is again uh, uh, cut in, into half, uh, not even in half or whatever. So that may be the next step, but um, now when, when we move forward, it's a time diagnosis and time prognosis, we can look forward and uh, there is a part there in, in this uh, Crimea, the Tatars. There were always Tatars there in our meeting too. And by the way, the new president there, who is not a president, he was also in our course. And I gave him a certificate once, it was several years ago or so. He's a young guy, he's only 39 years old or whatever. And uh, I think he was among those young professors who came from Kiev, uh, together with those from Sipferopol and so on. So, <coughs> nevertheless, the, obviously, these people now, the Tatars, which may be 11% of the population, they may not be happy about the referendum on Sunday because they fought with the German Liberation Army against Stalin during the Second World War. And then Stalin punished them. Now, Stalin didn't say that they were punished, but he settled them. He resettled them in Central Asia. And the reason was that he thought if, he, if they stayed in the Crimea where they have their mosques and their memories and so on, then they would hold on to these traditions and so on. But if they would be transplanted into Central Asia, then they would forget about it. But when Stalin died, they all came back. And so they are in the Crimea. Now they must be frightened that when that becomes part of the Russian Federation, that they again may be discriminated against or maybe even taken out and settled uh, in Central Asia again. Did, did so more come back in 91 hmm? after, after the fall of the whole Soviet Union? Even more came back. Yeah, more came back, yeah. So, and they may feel threatened. So <laughs> the government in Sepharopol right after Sunday must make sure that this minority is well taken care of. Uh, I mean, religiously, they are Muslims and they are surrounded by Orthodox people, <laughs> mainly. So, uh, but there should be no problem that this can be done, and I hope it will will be done well. Millions of Muslims <coughs> in the hmm? Russian Federation already. Millions and millions of Muslims there. Yeah, right. I mean, in, but the Kiev Muslims, see, they fought 
against Hitler. They fought with Stalin. And so they didn't have that problem. They stayed there. They were there all the time. So um, so they, they, there is no problem with them. So nevertheless, that as far as our... We know that Habermas and Hegel and so on, they talked about time diagnosis and time prognosis. So that is a way how one does the critical theory from day to day when you see the news, and that was a good example. You know, Rooney, I think also it's very important to talk about now the provocations of NATO, to be flying all these flights around yeah. Poland, you know, in the Baltic right. states, and okay, the yeah. carriers, and, and right. But, you know, this is all, of course, symbolical. I mean, we put a cruiser in there. There is in Sebastopol, which is north of uh, Yalta, and there are, is the Russian fleet there, and there are uh, air carriers, and huge battleships and so on. But I mean, uh, a cruiser, you know, c coming into the Black Sea, an American cruiser, this can just be a symbolic thing. I mean, he would be shot into the ground with, with one barrage or whatever, with nothing left of it. So, um, and there are also, they made some maneuvers with Romanians and so on. And I think that's all symbolical, and as long as it's symbolic, it's okay. In reality, as far as reality is concerned, there is no chance that this can be uh, can be prevented from here, and there we have to bring our old uh, idea in there about the uh, Slavic world that's called today the Euro Asian Union, and the Euro Asian Union is under Slavic leadership, so it's the Slavic world and it's the American world, and that they have to uh, to respect each other and should not penetrate each other's territory. Um, we don't like them to be in Cuba. We threw them out of Cuba when they came. We didn't like them to be in Venezuela. We don't like the uh, wherever uh, the people become socialistic, then there's the danger that the Russians appear again and so on. So, and that's understandable. And I think the Russians have to respect that. The, the Americas, you know, are our influence sphere. And but we have also to respect, you know, them on the other side. And this is in our own interest. If the, the Congress, you know, makes certain takes certain steps against the Russian banks or Russian businessmen, of course they will retaliate. They are not saints. They will, you know, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. So that means thousands of American businessmen have to leave the territory, you know. But uh, worse than that, we we have an, a Russian airport. We we land and fly in Russian territory in order to go to Afghanistan. Now, we will withdraw from Afghanistan this year, and if we have to get the other way around, we cannot use those uh, facilities of the Russians. It will go into the billions what we have to pay in order to get the troops back and so on. So it's under in our interest, you know, that the Russians will not withdraw from, from that and will say, you are out, you, you cannot land here anymore, or whatever. And the same thing is true in, in Syria, where we also need their support to get the gas out and, and so on. So, and in many other places. So, um, in, in Obama, you know, had this original good idea of having discourse and so on. And so we took our atomic weapons out of Poland and out of the Czech Republic, where they were. You know, that was a, a, a nice gesture which we did. We don't want to have their rockets here in Cuba. They don't want to have the rockets in the Czech Republic or in Poland or whatever. So, um, and there is something unhealthy here, namely that the golden rule is violated. What we don't want to have done to us, we should not do to other people. It is so simple again. And instead of the religious golden rule, we can take the categorical imperative uh, that means if you have a certain axiom, uh, make sure that this axiom can become the, law, the basis of a universal legislation. So we cannot make a universal legislation that we can just intervene over there, or that they can intervene over here. So that means we have to respect each other. We can compete in terms of, as we said, you know, in terms of solidarity and autonomy. We have a lot of autonomy, but we have no solidarity. What is the indication? That we cut the food stamps. That's a lack of solidarity. That we did not renew the unemployment compensation. That's a lack of solidarity. That we uh, have uh, didn't want this uh, uh, minimum wage there to $10 in the next three years or whatever. Have you ever lived with it? Maybe we have, but uh, I mean to live with 10 dollars an hour, you know, even that is not very easy. 
so even if you get twenty dollars an hour if you have two children or whatever this is uh, unbelievably difficult and, and so on so um and the, the whole thing you know that pilots uh, have to get food stamps because they are not paid enough to fly from here from Kalamazoo to Chicago or to Detroit you know this is all unbelievable you know that the state has to help the employees because the employer does not pay them enough for the eight hours they work there and, and so um, that is all a lack of solidarity right to, to make the whole thing clear so but they over there they have their own problems you know in terms of autonomy they had it under communism uh, and the reason why liberals and Catholics and fascists hate communism is that they emphasize the solidarity to such an extent that the personal autonomy may be threatened which can include all kinds of things to have your own business you know, not to be regulated and so on and so on all that falls under autonomy so therefore we have enough of work to do here to establish solidarity among ourselves and they have a lot to do in order to catch up with the modern idea the Kantian idea by the way of human autonomy and uh, and if we compete in that without shooting at each other and so on, that would be a great accomplishment because these front runners those two if they would get into an atomic conflict and so on the whole species would be pulled into it and would be annihilated in the process so that is uh, these front runners you know we had that before the Egyptians were at the front and and the Mesopotamians and the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans and the Germans and the British and so on so there is always a front runner there who has to bear the whole wind and the storm when you go forward he needs all the help from those who come in that's why the states here stole half of the Nazi uh, uh, scientists and brought them over here the Russians stole the other half it's a uh, as, as you could almost say it is as it ought to be because those who are superseded must give whatever they have in order to support the front runner which now carries all the responsibility for the others so therefore to spy on Merkel and so on Merkel may scream and the French and the Spanish and so because of the spying but in reality A they cannot do anything about it and B they there may be some truth to that argument we protect you too when we do that nasty thing it's nasty but we have to do it and so on. So, in a certain sense the front runner has a higher right than the others that may not sound very well but because he has the higher responsibility he has to pay with his blood and his money and, and so on as well So, and he cannot play golf so easily when you are in the back there in the niche you can play golf and stand on your head or whatever, but when you're in front there, that is a stressful, stressful situation. So in the meantime, you know that we found out the CIA even, um, you know, spied on on the senators and the, and the congressmen here and so on. So Feinstein protested against it yesterday. So, <laughs> but see, while everybody pays lip service against spying, everybody does it, and whenever it's done, it's a crime but they all do that crime in one way or the other so they're all damned hypocrites and they know that they are damned hypocrites so um, there is this split between the law and what people really do and have to do in a certain sense because you always have to know you know who governs on the other side who are the real forces are they a threat to you or not are they a possible threat so there are legitimate interests that you know what the other side or the other capital or the other guys what they do with their army and with their navy and the air force and, and all this so <coughs> uh, so nevertheless this uh, was our contemporary issue and um, so the next reading would then be Horkheimer's Critical Sociology of Religion we are not so much concerned with the religious thing but what in that book what is there are two partners on, two, on both sides one is Dex and Kogon. Kogon is, was a Jew. I knew him for years and years and had no idea that he was a Jew. Um, he was um, a lawyer and he took care of the no estates of the nobility in Austria 
and their interest in Germany and so in Germany he criticized National Socialism in 1933-34 they caught him and they put him into the concentration camp of Buchenwald near Weimar where Goethe was and uh, he was uh, seven years he worked in the office and he was a political scientist so when the Americans uh, liberated Buchenwald they gave him a jeep and he drove with his jeep from one as Dustin did from one concentration camp to the others and uh, studied the structures and then wrote a book, The SS State, and that you can get in our library. And it has been re-edited again in the 2000-something, it came out again. So it has become a classic about Theory and Practice of Hell, is what it's called now. Theory? Yeah, that's the American name, okay. So, um, so that's Eugen Kogon. <laughs> and his friend was Walter Dirks. Um, Walter Dirks was a theologian, a Catholic theologian, and out of some reason he didn't go on with it. He stuttered, and maybe the stuttering was didn't uh, prevented him from becoming a priest. And he was then an assistant to Romano Guardini, who was a famous uh, Catholic theologian who unfortunately did not resist uh, fascism enough. Uh, he had a certain life philosophy uh, which was popular and he was professor in Berlin at the university and <laughs> was never fired and always had a job and uh, so well how far he collaborated is not entirely clear but uh, I was very much fascinated in my youth by, by him he had his writings of Dostoevsky and all that was, was very beautiful so um, something like Eliade or what but not uh, not that far to the right, but nevertheless, Walter Dix uh, worked with him. And um, then from the very beginning took, uh, already in the 20s, opposed fascism. So he um, made a, a big uh, opposition against paying pensions to the aristocracy. <laughs> so the emperor left for Holland and the nobility in Germany was uh, lost power. And then there was the question if the uh, Republic had to pay all these noble men now salary, and he was against that. Also, Germany wanted to have a new uh, battleship, and he opposed that battleship as well. He was a journalist then in the Frankfurt newspaper, and there he was put into prison some time, and then afterwards he went into internal exile, as this was called, um, in the uh, in some little Bavarian village where he stayed during the war that nobody would, uh, would notice him. So both of them uh, met then in, uh, in Frankfurt in 1945 when the war was ended and then founded a journal. A journal was this Frank Frankfurt, Frankfurt journal, it was called the Frankfurt Hefte, and it was a left-wing Catholic thing. So Kogon had converted to Catholicism and to the Dominican tradition, so that means natural law and all this, and um, so they then founded this and brought all kinds of left-wing people, and you can go up to my room there on the right side, you have all the Frankfurter Hefte from 1945 on to today, and they are still coming in, um, and both of them became old and uh, couldn't go on anymore. They sold it to the Social Democrats in, in Germany. So it's now a Social Democratic thing and it's called the New Society Frankfurt, after Frankfurt Journal and so on. So they um, took it over. <laughs> Somehow in the end the two uh, fell apart, un unfortunately. They were good friends and worked together. But it was over the theodicy problem, which is the main problem for all the world religions. And so they had some kind of a conflict where Walter Dirks suddenly said, Eugen, you cannot say that you have to be uh, in the concentration camp first before you have the right to be happy. Or if you have not been in a camp, then you have no right to be happy and so on. So Walter was running in the next room and was weeping and Kogon was in the other room. And then finally, after a little while, Kogon went over and said, well, Walter, let's start again, let's, let's continue our work, and, and so on. So they did work together, but uh, uh, Kogon wanted to have a whole issue on the theodicy problem, and Walter Dix didn't want this. And so when I 
visited Walter around the time um, he had three assistants and they were all three atheists which is strange because uh, there were two Catholics and Walter was a very pious person took the marriage sacrament very seriously and the Eucharist and socialism these were the three things Eucharist, socialism and marriage and uh, so and uh, one of the uh, atheists yeah <laughs> Um, I talked with Walter and then the atheist said Walter now you have to be honest there and Walter always said these atheists they keep me honest so there he said then the atheist said well Walter um, you yourself you you had problems there with this uh, with this theodicy problem there so don't don't uh, pretend that you didn't have any problems with it and so and Walter was honest and said I suffered a lot in my life and so on but <coughs> somehow it was against his nature somehow to uh, to discuss that the justice of God in the face of the injustices uh, which are happening and <coughs> he died from Alzheimer's in the end and I visited him during that time and he, the atheist also told me that uh, he had depressions bouts of deep depression and they drove him down to Seals Marie which was a Benedictine monastery in Switzerland, beautiful my God went with me once and he ran out <laughs> because his Protestant soul was exploding in this Catholic uh, the, 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 there is a Baroque Catholic Baroque church we have no Baroque here so you don't know what it, what it is but Baroque church you know is huge and full of <coughs> angels half naked and whatever uh, a little type of it is also Rococo where the angels get a little bit smaller and a little bit wilder and so on, but it's fundamentally the same thing. So it was, it belonged to the Baroque period, and um, Baroque was the last attempt of the Jesuits. The guy, now the Pope, is a Jesuit. The Jesuits in the 18th century tried a last time to create a united European Christian civilization, and that was the, uh, was the, uh, the expression of it. And there was only one Protestant in it, and that was Johann Sebastian Bach. Bach, as the composer, composed Baroque music, in spite of the fact that he was a Protestant. He produced uh, Jesuit music, and so on. So, when you listen to the Matthew, Saint Matthew Passion play, I sang in Frankfurt, during the bombardment, by the way, I sang the, the Boyd's choir, choir there in, about this. And, and it's beautifully Baroque in, in all its, its ways. So, nevertheless, that, um, as far as the... So, Walter... Did Mike could handle it in there? Uh, wa no, Mike could not handle it. He, uh, we went to a Mass, and it was a high Mass, and uh, the mo higher it got, <laughs> the more <laughs> poor Mike had to run out. I found him later on in despair outside somewhere <laughs> where he was sitting there. He couldn't stand it. The holy smoke, you know, a lot of uh, smoke all over the place and lots of priests, and so it was a big celebration. But <laughs> the um, you have it in the Orthodox Sea too. When you go to Moscow, you have uh, a huge cathedral there too. It's not Baroque, but it's uh, much older, pre Romanic or whatever. St. Cyrus or St. Basil. Right, and they basically, yeah, and they brought an architect from Constantinople um, to build it and blinded him later on so that he could never repeat it again. <laughs> but, um, you know, there, there are many people who would say, you know, when you go there and you hear those deep uh, songs of the monks or so, you really think you are in heaven. So the, uh, and there are also a lot of angels uh, flying around there all over the place. So, so nevertheless, Martha in order to overcome his depression, um, the atheists drove him there <laughs> to make him feel better. And uh, I think he did feel better. So I, uh, several times before he died, I visited him, and um, Karen came along too once, and, and, and Mike came along, so I took people along there. <coughs> and he lived in a tiny l a little village in the town of Small, uh, not in, in the uh, Black Forest, in oh, the Black the Forest, Forest, yeah, Black Forest. <coughs> not a nice house, but um, it looked a little bit like a monastery. There was a huge crucifix, and then there was also a wonderful piano. He played was a great piano player, and that brings me to this book now and the friendship between uh, Dirks and Adorno. 
So they were two friends. Adorno was half Jewish music uh, specialist, and he composed Adorno composed uh, um, uh, music, and uh, um, also was a great piano player. And I think you were the one who bought me this picture mm -hmm. in Frankfurt. There is now a glass box, right. and there is his desk, Adorno's desk there, and there is this instrument, you know, which shows you the uh, the tact of the, the music. Metronome. What is it called? Metronome. Metronome, yeah. So yeah. stands there in the middle of, uh, in the of Frankfurt. Frankfurt, yeah. the, the right wingers attack it all the time. It's, yeah. it's, it's up there behind the picture of your granddaughter's okay. marriage day. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Okay, you can look at it later on. So, um, <coughs> nevertheless, these two were friends in the 20s already. And Adorno, he studied Albert Berg and so on in Vienna. And he introduced Walter into this new music. Later on, after the war, uh, uh, Adorno uh, uh, employed Walter Dix in the uh, uh, in, in the institute in Frankfurt, and they also wrote book together in honor of Horkheimer and so on. So, Walter, a Christian on one side, and a Catholic, and so on on the other side, Adorno, the Enlightener, and at the same time, uh, um, Adorno was uh, was a half Jew. His father was Jewish. His mother was Catholic, a famous singer. And he had an aunt who was a famous pianist, so they were famous all over Europe. So that's where the music came from. So it was high middle class in or uh, middle middle class in Frankfurt, where I come. So Frankfurt is a wonderful place. There's Adorno came from Frankfurt, Fromm came from Frankfurt, uh, Schopenhauer came from Frankfurt, and Goethe came from Frankfurt, and so on. So uh, it is a very intellectual place there. And the new school of learning of the Jewish people. Uh, the synagogue, when I was in the crystal night, I came out of the swimming pool, um, that synagogue which burned down, there was a famous rabbi who was a mystic, and he had influence of Krakow and many of the critical theorists. So it was very intense. And what is so sad in the whole thing, I grew up there in this Catholic church, little church, Frankfurt North, and of course I became involved in this, uh, involved in this Catholicism. But we never knew, you know, when, when the synagogue da burned down, I only saw a synagogue burning down. I had no idea that there was this powerful uh, intellectual circle which always met in this in this synagogue and, and so on. So that is a very sad thing. You can live in the same city and have completely split cultural circles who are not in contact with each other. So then you are happy already that I, I never sensed any anti-Semitism in my Catholic group, which was unusual because there was century-old anti-Semitism in Catholicism, but there was never any any trace of it. So, but that was how far it went. Nobody ever knew what great thinking was going on there, just in, on the other side of the of the city of Frankfurt. So. Nevertheless, none of them, you know, uh, uh, Mark, uh, uh, Hockheimer and Adorno, they were good friends, and uh, uh, Hockheimer was a full Jew, um, and they did their own thing, and then Kogon and Dirks on the other side, nobody ever converted to the other side, but they respected each other, and Hockheimer and Adorno wrote in the Frankfurt Journal there, and, and Habermas too, so um, there was a back and forth uh, exchange, and, um, and of course, our Cabinet Donna respected Kogon because he went through the camp and experienced it all. And uh, uh, so, and uh, so that, uh, as far as the book is concerned, so it can introduce us a little bit about the Frankfurt people and how they interacted with the culture outside of them. Okay, and then you can choose your depth study. And uh, you can take, you know, from Hannes or, or somebody else. Okay, that is all. Do you have any question about that? <coughs> what we what we said so far, and we are ready now to look at the uh, at our test there. Anything about anything? N not only what I said now, but if there's anything on your heart which you would like to uh, discuss, here is the opportunity. I would like to talk a little bit more about time diagnosis. Yes. Uh, it, it came up on the last test, and I, I went in trying to uh, to write the question, and I couldn't find anything on time diagnosis. Really? Yeah, it was a, yeah. a hard thing to track down and get a, a good concept of what exactly it was. Yeah. So maybe a little bit, because I know in, in this exam here you have a couple questions of actually doing a time diagnosis, and I'd like to know what.
what that looks like. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the uh, it would. I mean, what you do is you take a certain fact, as we did this now, uh, you know, Yalta or or Kiev, and here we have all this you know, crisis in Ukraine, and so. So you read something here, you know, in the newspaper, see something on television, and then you start the uh, uh, here scientists worked for the CIA, you know, the German fascist Werner von Braun, you know, was an SS colonel, and he got us to the moon, and so you have uh, there's something the holy and the unholy. Uh, there is the relationship of the Vatican, Pius and Pius the Eleventh and Mussolini and Pi the Twelfth and Mussolini and Hitler and so on. So you see any of those, uh, but the best thing is to to have some kind of a fact, you know, something which uh, immediately happened. And uh, then, uh, let me just see if I find this. Uh, oh, here it is, number two, yeah. And then the first thing is you just tell the story, right? So now, you never get the whole story. That is one negative thing already, right? So, uh, because uh, story, uh, an assassination of uh, Kennedy, you know. I mean, it's still are not entirely clear who did that and so on. So then you have a public version, and but is it can it be trusted? There was a trial and it was reaffirmed, but people's doubts were still not uh, settled. Were there one sh shooter or were there two or three shooters and so on? So you don't get the whole story, so you have to be satisfied with some kind of a half story. And you know it will develop, you know, maybe 50 years later or whatever, but you just have to take what, what, what there is. So, and then you can look at it, uh, you know, in terms, uh, so if we have a class, you know, religion and social ethics, I would say, look, is there something religious in that event, you know, uh, either openly or covered up and so on, or are there ethical problems involved in it. So you can do the time diagnosis in terms of a certain theme that you have, uh, you know, um, so, and then uh, look at it that way, and then there is a time prognosis involved. So as we, as we did, you know, we said, well, this is what happened last week, and, and in the time diagnosis, you have to go back into history very often, you know, where it comes from. So we went back, you know, to 1989, the uh, neoliberal counter-revolution, and it continues this. So, and, and we can go back, you know, about the history, what happened in Kiev with the Jews. You know, when I came, it was the anniversary, uh, 12 years ago, I came to the city the first time, and the horrible experience, you know, the, the 180 Jews had been killed there just a few years earlier, and then uh, first I didn't know any more. Then I found out then that there was a quarry near uh, near Kiev where, where uh, 36,000 Jews were killed, and then only recently, and there you see how the story never ends. There was a German woman whose father was a flyer in the German Air Force, and he flew around uh, the Eastern Front and took pictures. And so she looked up in the album there, and she found pictures of that quarry near Kiev, where they killed the 36,000. But he didn't take pictures of the dead. He took pictures of their clothing, because b before they were shot, they took their, had to take their clothes off. So he saw these heaps of clothing all over the place, and so as he flew back and forth and, and took these pictures and so on. So, uh, that you know that comes into the time diagnosis that you look backward so to, and then there is the issue you know, of looking forward. So next Sunday, you know, there will be the referendum, and sometimes you can make a prediction, which may be right or wrong. We know that Hegel made time diagnosis, you know, which where he was right in terms of hundred years ahead of time. Uh, so when, when suddenly the Russians and the Americans appeared in Berlin, um, then people remembered that there was this president of the University of Berlin who said, you know, that the Russian, the, the uh, Slavs and the Americans uh, uh, were in the, coming into the foreground. That was 100 years before it happened. So that means to combine uh, a tremendous amount of uh, history, for him that was about 6,000 years, and to combine that with the dialectical method. So that one is a dialectician. I think 
we found out that to be a dialectician is something to look very different at the world than other people. So, and if you um, if you combine this dialectics with this tremendous material, um, empirical material, there is nothing against empiricism. <laughs> then you can also make these predictions, and you can say, well, the referendum will po possibly. Um, go through and so a month later or whatever they will be members of the Russian Federation and they will be an independent state in the Russian Federation like the others, it will be the smallest state and then there may be difficulties with one group and that is, uh, we can foresee that and then we have to see that they are protected and so on and then also for our doing it, you know will we go there again or not so it's not only the diagnosis but it's also the action which comes from that. You see, it depends. Um, they may be so hateful against um, Americans that it will be uncomfortable to go. My family doesn't want, to, nobody wants to come with me, and so maybe can, yes, we can go together <laughs> again. We did that before. Um, so, but I mean, they may say, you know, it has become too uncomfortable now. We have to settle. You know, the Russian bear as far as laughs is concerned, you know, like you know, Aryans or whatever, they are not only physically different, they have nice round heads and so on, but they also have a different personality. So when they love you, they really embrace you like a bear and uh, they really love you deeply forever and ever. But if you make them angry, then <laughs> they lose it. And so you better, you know, wait a little bit until until you go back. So we have to see um, how they, you know, how they feel when we when we come. Well, because they might, I mean, maybe they even have a visa ban on it if we're going to Yeah, right, them right. Them, it's, you know? Yeah, ho hopefully not. It's, it's uh, you know, it's just so superfluous all what we do now. It's it's just for home consumption, you know, in order to satisfy those people who say you are weak, you are weak, and so on. You know, if we so can have it to Saudi, hmm? the, the Crimean and exile, we can go to Saudi and have it. Yeah. And then you can meet yeah, the king and get right. the camel. Yeah, <laughs> we can. We could go to Petersburg. Some people said we should go to Petersburg instead, but uh, but I um, I was against possible. that in in Yugoslavia. I went for five. I went into the civil war, and I did not go to Amsterdam or anywhere. And all the others went somewhere. So finally, I think I was alone. <laughs> there was no way. I was the only course still going on. I think. I said, I will not go. I am not respecting those killers there or whatever, you know, I just go. I was suddenly, I, I loved all these six republics and the people from there and the students and then suddenly I was supposed to hate some of them and love some of them. I mean, I cannot do this to people. So I just went, went on. So so we have to see, you know, what, uh, what if uh, it would make sense. So our, our purpose is uh, to help the civil society uh, uh, to develop in the Russian territory because they were a little bit weak. So what we say, you know, uh, autonomy, autonomy belongs to civil society. Civil society is liberal society. Therefore, it emphasizes the importance, the initiative, and so on, of the responsibility of the individual. And that's a good thing. And uh, so they need a little bit more of it, as we said. And therefore, it would make sense for us to continue to go there. But if the context is there, you know, and uh, I make always a lot of investments there, so it doesn't cost them anything, but uh, they get a lot, but they still may be so angry that they don't let us uh, come. You know, I, I'm emailing Dasha, the yeah. translator, and asking her about the situation, and she said it's the safest it's ever been, the happiest they've ever been. Really? To all the Russians, and she's right in Sebastopol. Yeah. I mean, they just, they're, they're looking, what her, her one good phrase that she said. Tatiana, you mean? No, Dasha. It was my turn. Oh, your friend, yeah, yeah. Oh. And she said, now is our time for independence. We cannot yeah. miss it. You yeah, know? okay. And so, okay. Yeah. And that's, that's okay. the, the attitude, yeah. basically. Yeah, you know? right. And she was where? In Sebastopol, where, where the Black Fleet, uh, the Russian fleet is. Well, yeah, and we, we have, I, I made a treaty between that university in Sebastopol and our campus here so that they would help us with the course and uh, I also wanted to have exchange, you know, that it's the best uh, uh, engineering university in the whole area. So, so um, I thought we could, uh, you know, have exchange, but no exchange took place so far. Uh, but uh, it's a treaty is there and I wanted to make one with Simferopol University as well and I will. So, but 
we will see wh what uh, you know. I, I think the damage cruisers there will not uh, change the situation very much, and uh, if they are really happy about this and uh, we shut up finally, you know, then um, maybe we can go. So we'll see. Otherwise, we have to wait a year or, um, and then go. Okay. So. Okay, that is what uh, what that means, and it goes back to to Hegel. But uh, the question is, you know, if uh, uh, if Hegel was a real a good discourse partner, um, just one story. Uh, I think I told you maybe already there. There was a conflict once. Hegel wanted to. Hegel was a Lutheran, and he started. He taught in a Lutheran university in a Lutheran state. Prussia was a Lutheran state, and so on. so. Um, and so he uh, had a lecture, and he lectured about medieval philosophy, and he wanted to make clear the difference between uh, the um, what is it called the um, the uh, interpretation of the Eucharist. Um, what is the formula there? So um, the Catholic Church emphasized the objective reality of the bread and the wine, that this was really the body and the blood of Christ. And they put it even into a, into a tabernacle, and they take it out and take it to sick people, and it is always this objective reality, and it looks as if you don't, it doesn't need any believers or whatever. Now what Luther brought in was the subjective side of the whole thing. So he would say, if you eat bread and you drink the wine as a believer, then this becomes then the real... Uh, so it was called consubstantialization, con consubstantiality. The Catholic teaching was transubstantialization. So to transubstantiate means the substance of the bread and the wine was changing into the body and blood of Christ, but the form remained the same. So the bread which you see and taste in the wine remains the same, but the substance inside has changed. While Luther would say consubstantialization, that means, con means together too, namely the objective reality which Jesus has instituted, but it needs the believer who in the enjoyment of the bread and the wine, then that must be contributed. Uh, because there was an extreme case where uh, a priest could celebrate a mass without any people there, and um, so the, uh, the the Trent Council ordered then that there at least had been one person there who uh, who participated in the mass. Otherwise, they would celebrate the mass because they got five gulden for it, and one after the other, and there were not even any people there. So that means it was an extreme objectivism, and what Hegel put against it was the uh, uh, the subjective side. So. Uh, the Lutheran interpretation is more progressive. It is more balanced than the Catholic one is, without doubt, objectively, I would say. So, nevertheless, Hegel wanted to make clear what that means. So he said, when the Catholics, you know, eat the bread and the little piece falls down and the mouse comes and eats it, then they have to kneel down before the mouse. But that was not all. He added in Latin that even when the mouse is defecating, then the Catholics have to kneel before that as well. Now that went very far. So, <laughs> and the bishop, um, the bishop uh, was very angry, in the, and and there was some kind of a culture war going on anyway against Catholics. So he protested to the cultural minister, who was a good friend of Hegel and said that this Hegel he has to apologize to us because of saying this. So Hegel then wrote a, a letter in his own excuse and he said, look, I am a Protestant uh, teacher in a Protestant university in a Protestant state and therefore uh, I have the right to make things as clear as possible and for the students and that was the best way I could do and so on. So, well, the next day a priest was sitting, he had lots of students, and so a priest was coming in, and he stared at Hegel there, sitting in front, staring at him all the time, and so Hegel stopped his lecture and said, you cannot stare me out of my seat, <laughs> and so, 
Uh, then the priest, angry, just left and never came back again and so on. But um, I was, in the 80s or so, I was in Berlin and there was a group of old uh, socialist professors and uh, so uh, one of them said, you know, um, the, um, Hegel, you know, had no ability to have real discourse with people. He should have had a discourse with that bishop and with the Catholics instead of just putting it there and so on. So, um, but I said, you know, uh, can one really demand that when you see the real situation, you know, the tensions and so on, what was a real discourse, uh, real possible? Yeah, and and uh, for the for the socialist professor, he said that was typical discourse denial, uh, and uh, so he should have acted differently and, and so on. So, but um, discourses are not so easy as uh, as people. People think, you know, in the meantime, there are discourses between Catholics and Lutherans and so on. They're going on for decades and decades and uh, don't get anywhere. Okay, so that as far as, um, you know, discourse and inside of the discourse, then one can make this time diagnosis that one takes a certain event and then tries to um, diagnose it, I mean, analyze the event. And in order to do that, one needs, of course, certain uh, categories. Then um, uh, uh, categories like should be should be an ethical analysis or sociological analysis, and one would have to take, you know, the ethical or uh, or sociological categories in order to do that. And it would go uh, almost automatically over into a prognosis, and it would go automatically over from theory into praxis too. Uh, what to do about this. Like we made it clear, you know, about our uh, diagnosis of care situation up to <coughs> what will happen next and what will we do, um, uh, you know, next November or so about this whole thing. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anything? Okay. Hmm? I'm trying to find where I can find that story. Do you know what, what volume? I found it in the Heterodox Hegel, the book. Yeah, I have that up here, yeah. He told the story? Or? Well, that's where the only place I found it so far. Oh. It, it what did you look, under mouse? I looked under Trans Hegel and Transubstantiation. <laughs> <laughs> that okay, the right thing. You're looking under Hegel's look. mouth or something. <laughs> yeah, one would have to look under uh, uh, Consubstantialization. Because uh, it was a defense of uh, of the Lutheran thesis against the Catholic position. Yeah. All right, I'll see if I can find it. Okay, <laughs> very good. Now, um, how do we want to make a little break first, or do you want to go on? Take a few minutes. Yeah, it's, pr- it's about twenty after eight. We should have a break for a minute. Okay, take a little rest and then take some cookies. Yeah, a lot of jokes about him. 
too. Yeah. I have to find it. He was sniffing, sniffing tobacco and <laughs> told the students all the time to uh, not to smoke and all this, and then he went in the corner of the classroom and sniffed. <laughs> If I could thought they wouldn't notice it, huh? Believe me, I would. I would just sit there with my Churchill. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But they told me in Olivet I can't do that. So <laughs> then I think in Heidelberg he came into the classroom. The system in your class. Right. He came into the classroom and he didn't have any shoes on. He <laughs> lost them. <laughs> I've done that before. <laughs> then he procreated. He had this illegitimate son and forgot completely about it. <laughs> Only eight years later, suddenly the little guy appeared in his house. How can that happen? I have to think about bigger things. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my dad told me once that I might have a few brothers and sisters running around <laughs> Vietnam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> 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 like, really? He's like, yeah, we had a lot to drink when we were there. <laughs> yeah. So you never know, I might get my brother Nguyen Bird or something with this show. Yeah, I was, uh, I was active with my wife in, in Germany, when, you know, after the war. Uh, there were a lot of uh, illegitimate children there. Mm -hmm. And the Germans didn't have the dating system, and so the French neither, and it was, uh, it was just a shock for all of them. Dating means that you do a lot of sexual symbolism, and it doesn't mean a thing. And they, these Germans and these French, they all thought it meant something. And then they then they left the country, and the poor women were there with the little bambinos, and and then of course nobody would touch them anymore. So boys in the village or whatever, she would not have a chance forever. Mm. And that was very bitter. And uh, and then very often they adopted, uh, they gave them for adoption. So American officers took the little ones and gave ten pounds of coffee for it or whatever. But that was not the end of it. They always came back again and wanted to have more coffee. And it was just illegal and, and unregulated. And so my wife and I, we put some order into the whole thing. Yeah, there's all kinds of jokes on Hegel and this damn thing. Really?
when you go there, there will always be little pebbles there. A lot of Jewish friends come there and put the pebbles on his grave. It was amazing. You have a picture of you and Mike up there, isn't it? Yeah. With Hagel's grave? I don't know if it's there, yeah. And um, so then uh, uh, Recht read, you know, the, the phenomenology. He read the Bible and the phenomenology. That was amazing, you know. And I wonder what he saw in the phenomenology. Brecht thought we'd die like the animals. But maybe after he came to his own death, maybe he thought a little bit differently about it. It's certainly not in the phenomenology, you know. So, um, and then he also wanted to make sure that he was really dead. So they had to put a needle into his heart. He was afraid he would wake up in the grave. Brecht? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so he, um... Uh, you know, in the 19th century, they used to put little bells mm -hmm. on there just in case if you woke up in the grave, there was a little bell okay. you could pull a little string, you could pull it oh. in the bell to alert people. Oh, good luck, sir. Dig me out. Great. But, uh, you know, Rudy, I, I just saw a story talking about diagnosis and prognosis. And was, he was in the Grand Rapids area that a woman died already in 2010 and she died in her SUV um, going to work. She was getting ready to work. She must have had a heart attack or something, whatever. But all her bills were on automatic pay. It was out by Detroit. Was it was out by Detroit? Yeah. yeah. And so all of her bills were on automatic pay. And so they just kept taking the bills out immediately yeah. until she ran out mm -hmm. of money. And then that's when the bank started beginning, you know, not worried. Cause they were, hey, why aren't you mm -hmm. paying? And so people came out, and that's when they finally found the body. So you're talking about an atomized society. Yeah. Someone lays there for almost four years yeah. then, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And no one knows, right. no one yeah. takes you know any type of interest yeah. in going and seeing the person or not seeing. And yeah. they thought at work, well, she didn't come, so she yeah. just must have quit. Yeah. But, but if she had told the neighbor she was might like, move to Germany or something like that, yeah. and then she just wasn't there anymore. Yeah, yeah. and it was it's unbelievable, but that's the kind of yeah. atomization right. that we're in. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I think about even in my own neighborhood, we had uh, an elderly gentleman, especially with the you know, older folks living alone. You know, if they don't have yeah. large family connections, we had a guy who was about a block down, and he, he died, and he apparently it took him a couple weeks like, like last summer for mm -hmm. anyone to even realize he was dead. Right. Right. Yeah, so that is the. Until I mean, when you yeah. talk about the you know, especially in modernity, compared to yeah. the traditional family where the three generations are right. always together and the right. home are yeah. very close. You know, with this type mm -hmm. of society that pushes the family all over the place and splinters right. the whole thing, you know, that that, yeah. that type of, you know, event can happen. Exactly, yeah. I mean, it can happen in the same uh, prospect of building, you know, skyscraper. Mm -hmm. <coughs> they don't notice anything, yeah. <coughs> I mean, that is what has to be balanced here, you know. And on the other side, you know, it's they have solidarity, but it's true also for the kibbutzim. It's true for monasteries, too, you know. I mean, I couldn't live in the kibbutzim, you know, there's no autonomy, experienced autonomy, you know, everything is regulated, you know, the morning to the night, even if you do photography or whatever, you know. Well, you know, even Thomas Merton needed uh, the autonomy, yeah. that's why they let him live in that little right, hut yeah, out there, exactly, you know, by yeah, the lake yeah. in Kentucky, because yeah. to have that much solidarity within the yeah. monastery was too constricting for him, right. you know what I mean, and for what he, his gift of writing and thinking about things. He was not supposed to write, you know, he was, uh, he was right. a Trappist, so he was supposed to read the Bible and, and then the Invitatio Christi, and that was all, you know. Yep, when yeah. they gave him a dispensation. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, but some people feel good, you know, in that they don't want to have this autonomy, it's too, because it can be torturous too, you know, to make your own decisions all the time and so on. You know, it's interesting, uh, I don't know if you got it, the newsletter from, it came this week, mm. um, the one, you get those too, right? Mm -hmm. them too. If you read there, it's by Brother Abraham and why people go into the monastery mm -hmm. and, and the problems they have with their families, asking questions about why you want to do this and whatnot. You know, but mm. a lot of what he talks about is, is, is the regulation. You know yeah. what I mean? It is liberating in some kind of sense for some people. Yeah. For other people, it would be completely stifling. Yeah, right. And it's a matter of age, you know. They called me in the kibbutz, you know, they told me you're just too old, you know, to to, um, to join. You have to do that from youth on or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
And the same thing in the monastery. You can yeah. join within a certain age. After that, they say you're... And so in, in East Cup. Germany, too, you know, the Democratic uh, Republic there, uh, many, very often, you know, youngsters came to West Germany and, uh, and they liked a lot there, but then they went back. And why they went back was there was no friendship. They felt alone, you know. And then in the West, they didn't talk about a better society. They thought one should study that. If one study sociology, one shouldn't only study what's the case, but one should go beyond it, you know. Yeah. And I know when I was there, it was still communistic, you know. Um, these youth uh, communities were beautiful, you know. They were all interconnected and they were wandering into the mountains and um, they had projects. For instance, they wanted to build a dam up there in the harbor of the Baltic Sea. And so from all the whole thing, they took uh, little uh, things there, put stone in it and carried them all the way up to the coast and put them there. So it was their common project, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was enjoyable somehow that they did all this together. So that they had. But on the other hand, you know, there was this, uh, what we have, you know, this autonomy was missing. Yeah. I think, you know, people here, doctors particularly, they have nothing against helping people, but they don't want the state to do it. They want to do it themselves. And now when you have 40 million old people, you cannot do it yourself, you know, the individual doctor. You cannot leave it to his arbitrariness or if he has something or doesn't have anything. That's what they don't understand and why they are so bitter about Obamacare. Mm -hmm. But so the problem's too big for that level of society. Right, right, right it is. Yeah, yeah. To yeah. The but we have to find something which has never been found before, maybe to find a balance between those two. Because traditional societies were all solidarity, you know, they had emphasized solidarity, family, kinship group, and all that. And uh, modernity then emancipated the individual from the church, from the family, from the state, and, and so on. So, And by 1900, they were then, uh, you know, so lonely that there was a lot of going back to the church again. Right. I, I just went from Wilhelm Reich, a Jew, you know, who talks about the Catholic temptation. He said the modern world went so wrong, you know, that there is really a Catholic temptation and so on. But, so Goethe and Hegel did not convert to Catholicism, but Hegel developed some kind of a crypto-Catholicism for himself. Um, but because the people were so ugly who became Catholic, that means the romantics, you know, and he didn't want to be a romantic, so right. he didn't convert. But by 1900, it was not the church, it was these mass movements, fascist movements, socialistic movements, you know, where people could forget about their liberated idea. That's Fromm's idea of escape, escape from freedom. Right. Um, you know, that was very strong. My brother always looked back with nostalgia to the Hitler youth and so on, because there was this community, you know. And then when fascism went over, then it became liberal again, and then everybody was alone again. Yeah. It has something to do with our enormous suicide rate, you know. Yeah. The suicide rate in the army coming from Afghanistan and so on is enormous, you know. And then when they're at home, they do that too. In Vietnam too. Vietnam, there was up to 50,000 suicide cases. That's as many people as died in battle, died by killing themselves. So that has something to, and Durkheim, you know, was the one who uh, looked at this. Durkheim found out, you know, that Catholics and Jews had much less suicide than Protestants mm -hmm. because Jews and Catholics emphasize community thing and Protestant, you're alone, you know, you have to stand before God and, and so on. So, <laughs> yeah. What I, what I find interesting about the modern day is that with all of our, you know, developments in technology, we, we all seem to be striving for more community yeah. somewhere. But it right. seems like the, the communities that we're creating and, and that we're being involved in are really more isolated than ever before. Virtual communities yeah. where everything is mediated through right. you know, technology. Yeah. Or whatever. There, there was a great book by a lady at MIT called Alone Together that pretty much summed it up. Yeah, sure. You know, when you see people in a whole big room where people sit at the computers and so on, and when one of them gets in trouble, for instance, you know, and tries to find help, it's a, how much help there still is. You know, the, in one case, you know, to make care, you just hang there with your problem, you know. And, 
But it still does happen, you know, that others leave their thing and come over and, and help you and so on. So there is a minimum of... Uh, but otherwise everybody sits very much in his own little cubicle. My favorite is always, you know, before I go in to teach or go into class and you see students lying in the hallway and everyone's... Oh, yeah. Right, no, yeah. No, no talk to each other. Yeah, that's a continuation of the whole thing, yeah. yeah. yeah I hate to be, you know, oh, back in my day, you know, we had, you know, I'm sure we doing things just the same way, but it, it seems like one of the things that has, at least in my generation, become so vastly different from the generations before is a, mm -hmm. this lack of connection. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, I see one cannot, one must not blame, you know, technology is mm -hmm. alone, yeah. um, you know, it needs some kind of another impulse or push to say, you know, we want to what we have is good, you know, this autonomy, but it has to be balanced by something else. And it shows then in these public issues like food stamps, you know, and uh, what idiocy that develops. And when you say that they should find a job, you know, if we feed them, then they have no in initiative. They, we enable them when we feed them, and so not thinking that they have to eat something in order to find a job. And they need unemployment compensation or to have some gas in the tanks so that they can drive out for, for a job and so on. So it becomes really absurd, you know, the whole thing. When you say, you know, all this social legislation is just enabling those lazy guys who don't want to do anything. So let's not give them anything. Then, you know, they find a job. They find food, you know. If you don't give them, they wake up, you know, get off the couch and uh, find something. I mean, this is an idiotic, uh, idiotic way. So... And uh, it will be hard, you know, because I see yesterday with these two devils, you know, um, how passionate people are about that and how enormous that hate is against Obama because he has become a symbol of this, you know, having a little bit more solidarity. Not much, you know, I mean, but even that little bit already mm -hmm. stirs people up. And the interesting thing is the businessman, the swimming pool, he let his license go because he said it doesn't make any sense anymore. He ruins the monopoly of uh, uh, free uh, of private insurance. So they know somehow that they are losing, but get awfully angry about that losing thing, you know. But uh, they, they know somehow that they are on the wrong side of history. And then, you know, one, one t should try to understand that there is a real danger that the state, you know, becomes all-powerful and takes the initiative and so on. It's not so much the immediate danger here, but they should be listening. It's a serious argument, you know. But then the best thing is then, you know, to do these things so they has no reason to intervene <coughs> now, you know. They cannot let that hang there and say, well, if we cannot make any profit, we will not uh, go into it, you know, I don't do this and uh, or leave it all to the market and, and the market uh, does not reach all these people you know that, and then it becomes horribly irrational but in discourse you know in the time diagnosis and so on one should listen even to those far right people you know because uh, it's a human position and uh, no human position is entire, totally without some truth and some rationality, and that's what one has to pick out of it. You know, if they are angry about abuses, they are right to be angry about abuses. I know some people are just sitting around, you know, and do, don't do anything, and don't apply for health care, and what do they expect, you know? If they have to go to the hospital, and everybody can do that, every day it can happen, uh, then the others have to pull them out, you know. Or they don't want to have any children or whatever. You know, the other people's children then should take care of them someday. That is the, the issue, the, the thing there. You know, it's, uh, or even not to get an injection, you know, against the flu or whatever. It means then that you may infect other people. Other people have to take care of you and you'll infect them and so on. So it is this uh, island type of a situation. Everybody is an island, you know, which is not real is not realistic. Okay, let's look at a few things there. If, uh, we, okay, let's do that five minutes and then look at one of the movies there. So please answer critically nine out of the following 
48 question essay form. You may concentrate your work on the question 15, and 15 is the um, is one of it's the depth study, the depth study on from or on uh, Habermas or on Hades. There are a few books there by by Habermas. I put them up there. And you can look at them. Doing so, take some of the other questions into consideration as well. Keep the questionnaire and add it to your notes. Okay. First question: Describe the main historical forms of discourse. So, discourse was obviously very important. You could say that the critical theory is an ongoing discourse. It started before the First World War and it went through one, two, three generations, and everybody participates in this discourse. And also, their main concern, you know, is what we call pragmatic. So uh, Habermas you know, talks about universal pragmatic. Um, it is really a linguistic pragmatic. Pragmatic comes from pratein, Greek pratein, to do, to act. So it's an action theory. The whole Marxism is an action theory. The whole Freudian thing is an action theory. So. Um, but uh, Habermas changed the whole Hegel, except the philosophy of history, into an action theory and followed even the whole system of Hegel. So, um, so that uh, um, discourse, we can define it as future-oriented remembrance of human suffering with the practical intent to diminish that suffering. So that fits psychoanalysis and it also fits Marxism and so on. Um, the Marxists uh, are a discourse in which they are concerned with future-oriented remembrance of the suffering of slaves, of serfs, of wage laborers, and with the practical intent to diminish that suffering. That would be a, a definition of discourse. Which historical forms of discourse does our discourse in the critical theory society belong? So, there was first a religious discourse, and Kant is right, the founder of sociology, right? August Kant. Uh, there was a theological discourse, then there was a philosophical discourse, and there was a scientific discourse. So, in the East, the Gautama is a great master of theological religious discourse. We had it also in Greece. Then in Greece, from religion, people, ecology, they go over into philosophy. Uh, Socrates, the philosophy, philosophical discourse, Plato, and so on, but and Aristotle, but uh, it still has strong religious elements. That means every new discourse form determinant negates the previous one. That means it says it's philosophical now, it's not religious, but religious elements are, main, uh, are still contained there. There are still myths which Plato uses and Aristotle uses, and even scientists use myths like Freud when he talks about the Oedipus complex and so on. Uh, so then, uh, in, only after Hegel, then the philosophical discourse goes over the scientific discourse. So Einstein did not go into the laboratory, but Einstein walked through the Alps and then discussed uh, the law of gravity and the relativity of the movements of the planets and so on. And then only after he had developed the formula, then they went into different places or different continents and when the sun was darkened, then they could see the planets and they could see the deviation. So it was first in thought that it was developed in discourse, and then it was verified through the telescope. That is an interesting type of thing, right? So um, that's scientific discourse. Now, we today, we can say, you know, that our discourse is a scientific one. It's a sociological one. It's a psychological one. Uh, but at the same time, it is also a philosophical one, and sometimes even theological elements come in. Right? So that, when you are a dietitian, um, you don't think that when the philosophers come, all the religious people are dead, or when the scientists come, all the philosophers are dead. That's how people very often think. But in reality, the new development negates, but also preserves, elevates, and fulfills, if it's going well, uh, what was there before. So what will happen to the discourse culture if civil society moves further toward alternative future number one the totally administered society then I mean the discourse may die down completely because it will be a signal society like when you go to the street corner red, blue, and uh, red, uh, uh, green or whatever so uh, people will say you know uh, 
should we have sex or not, and there will be a signal, now she can have a baby, so therefore we cannot have, and whatever, and there are no discussions anymore. Like, we don't have discussions when we come to the corner there, because the signal shows us to go to the right or the left, and so on, but when there is uh, electricity falling out like it did today, then suddenly the light doesn't go. What are we doing? Then we begin to signal to each other. In a certain sense, you know, we enter a discourse with each other. Who should go first? And so on. We wave. You know, you go first. And it works, by the way. It does work, you know. We can still do without signals. But it would be very uncomfortable, uh, you know, to take all the signals away. Obviously, we got used to them, and there's an advantage. So, Therefore, we'll go to into this totally administered side. It's almost unavoidable. Uh, so, and it will be very hard then. There's no need for an ethical discourse because it will all be regulated. You don't have to think what is, like the day when you push the gas pedal or whatever, you don't think about it. it. It will go all automatic. It would be a totally atomized type of society, a wayfied society, and so on. So there may be no discourse anymore. As far as future number two is concerned, a totally militarized society which will be also administered and that means the army will also be automatic today you know where automatic reactions set in and, and so on where you don't have to think anymore and so on um, it was already you know automated to the second world war to, to a large extent so that would be so as long as we still have this course we are not yet in future number one totally we are not yet in uh, in the second in the totally militarized society, um, there is a little book on Horkheimer, and there is a picture there what the total administered society is, and it shows skyscrapers, and it shows nine lanes like in Toronto, nine lanes of cars going into the city. There is no discourse anywhere anymore. These people are not in discourse there uh, on on the street. They are rolling hundreds of cars at the same time, and nobody talks with anybody. Maybe some truck drivers, you know, talk with another truck driver you know, over the phone and say, police is coming, police. <laughs> 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 yeah. you know, that, when I drove to Canada, I had a little machine there where I always knew when the police was coming. And then everybody talks to everybody, police is coming. Then they all slow down. And as soon as the police got, <laughs> they go on again. Yeah, so th that's the rest of discourse left. Uh, so, <laughs> but um, neither in the skyscrapers nor in, on these roads there, uh, there is uh, any any need for this. By the way, the airplane, you know, is uh, got lost, and the airplane got lost. Uh, um, and there you see, of course, technology on its top now. So they brought all the technologies in from all the secret services and so on in order to find that thing now. And uh, they cannot understand how such a big thing can get lost, you know. It's a shock for the modern consciousness. Everything should be under control. The, a big thing like that shouldn't get lost. And it has all the information on board. And it gets, so it gets signals all the time. And why doesn't it do it, you know. Somehow it turned around and nobody knows why the hell it turned around and, and so on. So, it is, that's a moment, you know, where you see the whole machinery, <laughs> the highest development, you know, of information technology and all this, and it's all in, in the, somebody turned it off, and, and that excites them. How can that be? You know, there are four or five of these things at this machine, and they all were turned off, and you see how hysterical they become about the whole thing, because it doesn't work. But that points, of course, to the, uh, <coughs> to the totally administered society. So, and they also say, you know, was it the mistake of the pilot? It shouldn't really happen. The pilot should be all automatic. As a matter of fact, the machines all fly automatic across the, uh, the Atlantic and so on. They only just have to watch that. And this and this shouldn't happen anymore because we have taken care of this. There is a computer for this, you know, and, and they get very upset that there are still little holes where it is not yet totally administered. Um, so that is obviously the trend where we are going to end. By the way, Horkheimer was not entirely negative on this. Um, this administered society will be uh, will be more just in a certain way, you know. So the injustices in terms of slums or whatever will all be uh, settled, you know. And what that means, uh, engineers could be at the head of the administered society, and you 
saw that in socialist countries already when I was in, in Rostock where I taught and how they had organized it. You know, there were roads going to the Baltic Sea and along the roads there was a railroad and then you could also drive with a car. You could also drive with a bicycle. There was also a place for that. And then on the right and the left there were the buildings where people lived. And at the end there were the factories for building ships. So there were four huge things which built beautiful ships, mainly for Russia and so on. So, but it was organized. You didn't get stuck in traffic or whatever. Everything f was flowing nicely and uh, it was organized through and through. And you could still see, well, maybe they should have a swimming pool there. Uh, but they didn't have a swimming pool because the, the Baltic Sea was only half an hour away. So it was organized. They, they all would go to the factories and then all would go to the beach and there was a nudist beach so people could really live out their happy life and, and so on. And by the way, a whole culture of nudist beach. That means nobody looked at somebody when was nobody naked that he had an operation or that he was old or young or the, the children saw the old people naked and so on. And it was all completely normal. It became unnormal when the Westerners came in, took pictures of the of the beaches suddenly and so on, which nobody thought about it. I had uncle there, he, he was one of my students' uh, girlfriend, and um, I went with her to the nudist beach, and uh, I was, what, what did they call that? Uh, uh, they had a name for people who had a bathing suit. It was ridiculous to have a bathing suit, so I wanted to find some place to put a bathing suit on. They all laughed themselves to death. <laughs> they, because it was, the, it was just against their whole culture, you know. But but I mean, they were not <laughs> laughing, you know, in a, in, a, in a nasty way. But they were just hilarious. <laughs> the guy had to put a bathing suit on still, you know. It was old, middle ages, you know. So no decent person did that anymore. So um, and and the priests were there too. I mean, they they, they, fought, they fought. Yeah, they fought against it for a little while, then they gave it up, you know. <laughs> And, and uh, about adultery, there was not more adultery than, than in the West, maybe less than that, you know. It, it, it is the bikini, you know, who makes you an adulteress, not the total thing, you know. So I think there's another trick involved in all this. So nevertheless, that, um, that is about the futures there and discourse. So discourse is an important thing there in, you know, in all of them. So... And Habermas has, of course, developed that more than Fromm has, and uh, Hanif has developed that as well. So, um, discourse is a very um, is a privileged form of communication. So it's called universal pragmatic or theory of action. These are all theories of action, and um, discourse is the most privileged action. And um, uh, the the action is rooted in language and memory, human potential, and in the human potential of the struggle for recognition. We said that this is what Marx and Habermas and so on did. They went behind Hegel's system, and then from these potentials or evolutionary universals, they bypassed the system, and in an unsystematic way. Then we're thinking about all these things Hegel had thought about. So they transformed it all into an action theory. And it was quite successful so far, uh, as far as it goes. So everybody who would simply be a Hegelian now and he would not be familiar with the universal pragmatic uh, would be a little bit backward. He would not be on the present level of science and sociology and psychology and so on. So, uh, okay, so... Uh, that and and um, then, as, as far as the discourse is concerned, there are also five points which are true for all communicative action, and that is there must be subjects involved. Number one, and subject to talk with each other. As they talk with each other, they produce a text, and they do that. The text has a certain structure, a certain grammar, and so on. And the text is produced in a certain context. And this is done for a certain purpose. So here you see the dialectical notion present, right? A are the subjects, and B is the mediation, namely the text and the structure of the text. And C is the goal. So they asked, they were dialectical for Hegel, and they are still dialectical 
for for Habermas, but the, and the students like Arendt and Poiket and so on, but they don't talk about it uh, as such anymore. So the five uh, five elements are uh, the subject just speaking with each other. As I now speak, I produce a text, right? And this text has a certain structure, and this is a certain situation which is different from the situation two weeks ago, and is different from the situation next week, and so on. And text and context hang together, and that has a certain purpose. What is the purpose? You know, our emancipation or whatever, why ever we do that. Increase our knowledge, or making ourselves knowing, and, and so on and so on. And this can, of course, in order to say something about uh, religion, can help, you know, to read the Holy Quran. That can help to read the New Testament, or the Bhagavad Gita, or so. You know, who has written this, you know, for instance? Was it Matthew, you know, or was it the ancient Gabriel, or whatever? Who has written it, and to whom was it sent as a message, you know? With whom did they talk? Did Mohammed talk with the Jews? Did Mohammed talk with the Christians? With what kind of Christians did Mohammed talk, right? And then the production of the text, which is at hand, which we have here, you know? Um, and then uh, what was the situation? That is most important. Because the Enlightener looks at the whole thing from the situation point of view. That means when he sees, you know, the book Leviticus, you should not, a man should not lay with a man, and so on. In what context was that said? And when it shows it was in the context of matriarchal temple uh, prostitution, then he says this context has been removed, and therefore the text loses its validity. So that can be, you know, the forces of secularity can drive into all of this by taking out one element of the discourse, and that is the context. A contextual, it's called that way, a contextual approach to the sacred text. And it can be devastating, you know, because this is the word of God, you know. Man has no right to touch the word of God. Uh, no rabbi, no, uh, no imam, or whatever. And God has said that forever. But now comes the context. You know, and the concept doesn't fit anymore. So the 613 bits vote of the Jews, you know, where the high priest should marry a virgin and so on, and then there's no high priest anymore since 70, and no virgins anymore. So therefore, the text is hanging in the air now, you know, and uh, well, that is the horror of the fundamentalist. The fundamentalist has a text which belongs into a completely different context. And in the new context, it goes from one friction to the other, you know, so that he loses all contact with the uh, with the historical process where he is, and gets into the different difficulties, you know, that he's either against blood transfusion and then does it anyway, or he lets his child die because he doesn't want to have a blood transfusion, or the court comes and sends the police and forces him, and so on. This is horrifying, you see. That is when you have a clash between a text which is out of its context. But what is the truth now, you know? What kind of a truth is that which becomes untrue when the context changes? So you can take all five of these elements of discourse together, or you can concentrate on one. So you can look at the New Testament, who has written that, you know? And then you see St. Paul and you read those texts and then you find out, you know, that maybe ten of his letters cannot possibly have been written for, for him because he was already dead. So you get that out of the text, you get the context, and you know in this context, Paul did not live any longer. Who were those five elements again? The subjects, talking, you know, the talkers, and then the um, the text which they produce, I talking now produce the text, and you are the other subjects who listen to the text, you know, and that is important too. To whom did St. Paul speak? To whom did Mohammed speak? Did he speak to the desert people, you know? Did he speak to educated people? Did he speak to middle class people and so on? You know, Jesus brought to the, brought to the proletariat, but the prophets in Israel talked to the middle class. That makes a difference how you talk, you know, to whom you talk. So the subject and the text and the structure of the text, which can be its logic, its grammar, and so on, and then the situation, the context, 
and then the purpose, you know. For instance, the New Testament, the purpose is not to take hist- to tell us the history or the Bible. The purpose is to prove that there was a revelation, that God has spoken, and, and so on. That is the purpose. So if you don't see that purpose and say, that's not really history or whatever, it's not supposed to be history. So you cannot write a biography of Jesus because none of the writers wanted to write a biography. All of the writers wanted to tell about the salvific and redemptive function of Jesus for this life and the next life. Uh, that means everybody wants to learn what Jesus has to say about the God who is the God of the living and of the dead, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and of the people who live and then who will be dead and so the God of the living and the dead. So that is what people want to know. And not if he was married or was not married or if he was divorced and so on. He may be all of that. But the subjects who wrote that text were not interested in it. That was not their goal. And they all have the goal together to make known that man, this man who appeared as the son of man or the son of God or whatever, and if we if we approach it, you know, with a purpose which we would like to impose, we'll be terribly disappointed. Okay, now we want to have a few minutes there for our... Um, oh, no, we don't have any time anymore, right? Unfortunately, we have to close. Okay, so just read it through, <coughs> and you can ask some questions about it, and if you feel strong enough, you can write it already. Otherwise, you can take another week. Okay, does that make sense? And thank you for your good papers. Good work. Could you take that chair over there again? And maybe this one too. Thank you. Okay, very good. Okay, you find your way out, right? Have you seen that there's an, a movie called Son of God out there? Uh, yeah, I heard about it, yeah. Did you read it here, Yeah, right. I don't trust those things because they all look like American movies. <coughs> well, it's certainly another uh, ben, Germanic... Ben Hur and all this, you know. Get another white Jesus. Another Germanic guy, you know. But also Spartacus or whatever. I'd enjoyed those movies once, but now I'm not so sure if we get the real Spartacus. Oh, probably not. <laughs> that's I, don't right. think, I don't think we've ever made a movie that's, you know, fully yeah. accurate. You, <laughs> you yeah. might really uh, in either enjoy or be totally disgusted by the latest version of Spartacus. Have you seen this? Yeah. The, what is it, who makes it? I forget. It's like Star, like Stars or whatever. Mm. Oh, my God. Did you like Saturday Night, was it? The Spartacus? Yeah. yeah okay, you find series. your way out, right? Yeah. Very good. Did you to watch it with you? No. Hey, he, I, I don't let him get anywhere near that, that show.